Hello again. So I couldn't think of a better setting for this next session, which is entitled Plant Trees, Not Just Seeds, Counteracting Deforestation. Um, we at the New York Times are very grateful to Google for helping support this event. And I'm just going to play a short video before we introduce the panel. Thank you. Hello. I'm Nicole Lombardo. I lead Google's Go to Market for the Environmental Insights Explorer, a free online tool that empowers thousands of cities with actionable data and insights to build a more resilient, sustainable world. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's session focused on a subject near and dear to many of us trees which are increasingly seen as a nature-based climate solution bringing many benefits. However, despite this, we've seen how several cities may not have the budget or means to measure trees across the region or understand where new tree planting efforts are most needed. So to help, we recently expanded the capabilities of the Environmental Insights Explorer with a new tree canopy tool based on Google unique data to help understand which areas are most exposed and to prioritize tree planting to protect the most vulnerable populations. We hope you enjoyed today's panel to learn more about how additional ways organizations are supporting both restoring and protecting trees all around the world. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Jeffrey Gettleman, who's going to introduce the, uh, the panelists. Jeffrey, come on up. Hi guys, I'm back. I was just here. Uh, we are gonna talk uh, in the next 45 minutes about trees, and I'm really lucky to be here with uh, people from very different, have very different perspectives on forestation, deforestation, agricultural issues, food supply issues. We have a very diverse uh, group of voices up here, and that's a real privilege to be with you guys. Um, this room is absolutely beautiful. There's probably no single symbol that's more resonant of nature than a tree. And my, just a, a little bit about me briefly, I worked in Kenya for 11 years for the New York Times, and then in India for four years. Now I've just moved to London. And one of my most beautiful memories of all my foreign correspondents was flying over Congo, uh, which I did many times to cover conflicts and social issues in the Democratic Republic of Congo but it's one of the last remaining rainforest basins in the world. And as you fly over it, you look down, and it's just this profusion of trees. That's all you can see. You can't see the ground. You can't see the rivers. You can't see any villages. All you see are these trees that almost look like they're evenly uh, of even height, like a broccoli forest, tightly packed together, just, just one tree, it's, it's leaves touching the other trees for miles and miles and miles. And whenever I would fly, I would just love just looking down and staring and wondering what, what was down there. Um, so I would like for us to introduce ourselves, and if you could start and just say hi to the audience <laughs> and a few quick things. Hi, I'm Robin Millington. I'm the CEO of Planet Tracker. We're a nonprofit funded financial think tank that tries to take the value of nature into financial valuations. That was super succinct, thank you. <laughs> Grant? I'll try to follow that lead. <laughs> I'm Grant Reed, uh, fortunate to be uh, CEO of Mars Incorporated, but a $40 billion family held uh, business. Very passionate about uh, putting things back into the ecosystems in which we operate. So it's great to be here. From Scotland originally, I'm not putting on this accent, it is real. It's a great accent. Elizabeth? Elizabeth Watuti, an environmentalist and climate activist from Kenya, and also the founder of Green Generation Initiative that nurtures young people to love nature, and I also head campaigns at Wangari Maathai Foundation. And as someone who grew up close to the forest, I just love to be in here. Thank you. Elizabeth has come farther than any of us for this, so that's, that's great. Thank you. Sandy? I'm Sandy Knapp. I'm a, I'm a botanist. I study trees um, from the Natural History Museum in London, so I haven't had to come very far, but I too grew up near the forest and love it. Well, I wanted to start with, with one of the biggest uh, headlines from last week, which were these commitments about deforestation. Um, we have really good perspe different perspectives. Like, you come from the world of business, you're an activist, you're a, a researcher, and Robin, you are a kind of blend, I think, of a few of these fields. So 
let's just get like a reaction from you guys. Why don't you start, Elizabeth? When you heard these commitments, saw the headlines, how did you feel? I mean, when it comes to commitments, I always say they are not enough if they do not really mean what's happening right now in terms of the world changing. And we have said that when it comes to climate action, it should be in addition to like stopping investments in fossil fuels, we have to massively increase nature regeneration and at the same time ensure that all our remaining natural ecosystems continue to stay intact. So if any of the commitments that are being brought forward do not help us attain any of that, then it means that we will not be halfway in terms of tackling the climate crisis. And it also has to be considerate to the people that are already bearing the brunt of climate change right now. So just to follow up, were, were you cynical or were you happy or what was your like sort of base emotion when you heard all this fanfare about that deforestation announcement? I wouldn't be so excited because we've had pledges before that have not been met till now at COP26, which is 26 years. Uh, I'm 26 and that has been like 26 years, 26 COPs. And we've had so many pledges and commitments from these conferences. And what really excites me as a young person is action and not really the commitments. But if I begin to see these commitments being put into place and immediate action happening, then that's what is going to excite me as a young person. Okay, fair, fair enough. S Sandy? I, I kind of felt a real mixture of emotions because I felt this is great. You know, we're going to be able to protect our forests, you know, because I agree with Elizabeth that, that actually protecting what we already have is really important. I mean, there's 60,000 species of trees on this planet, 60,000. 37% of those are threatened with extinction. So that, that's, I mean, that's pretty scary. 60,000 species of trees, 37% threatened with extinction. And I, so I was hopeful. I thought, great, 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 we can have this. But then, then my second thought was, I hope this isn't a race to deforest as much as we can before 2030. Because that's the fear. So, so I agree with Elizabeth that it actually you know, let, let's see what let's see what happens. But 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 if if we commit to this, if countries commit to this, then then you know that that's a good thing. It depends. It's always in the fine print. It's always in the fine print. Um, it's really nice actually to be in person. This is my first panel where I don't have to look at a screen of somebody thousands of miles away. So it's nice to like be face to face and make eye contact. Your thoughts? So. Without commitments, there would be no uh, forward direction, right? So I think the commitments are fantastic, but they have to then have the actions after them. So from the world that I'm working in, how do we get, for example, due diligence on supply chains, but real due diligence, legislated? How do we get some regulatory or financial uh, frameworks in place that will now push some of the companies to really comply to the due diligence? And for example, we could get listing rules on some of the stock markets that might say you can only list if you can prove that you're not deforesting in your supply chain, for example. So let's use the commitment as a platform to launch from to get some of these frameworks in place. Yeah, so this is my first COP. Um, I would say the commitments are necessary, but absolutely not sufficient. I, you know, I think we've made some progress since 2015, we were heading for four degrees, now we're heading for three, but three degrees is climate catastrophe. That's, it's a humanitarian catastrophe, and it's gonna be a catastrophe for businesses. So we have to drive further action. I think it's a bit of a free for all right now on uh, exactly how you define how we're gonna do it, when we're gonna do it. So we've got to turn, I think, good words into concrete actions and not wait 20, 30 years, we need to start right now. And I think it's great to share a, a stage with, uh, with Elizabeth because I think the young people have an absolute right uh, and it's great to see the energy you're bringing to it because we've got to, we've got to bring change. We all have to be activists in my mind. No, no, that's really well put. And I was on another panel with a, a young woman in Indonesia and I felt the same way. I thought it was really inspiring that one, we're, we're working together, you know, across generations a bit. And two, that there is all this interest 
uh, that's coming up. Now, let's talk about agricultural supply chain because you work for a huge business. Mars Company is one of the biggest food industry, biggest food businesses in the world. It's privately held. We all enjoy their products from time to time. Good. Um, I just learned they have a big pet food business, yeah. and uh, I met somebody actually that works there uh, in, at a soccer game, um, which I didn't know they were so dominant in the pet food business. You guys are, are part of the equation, and something we're seeing at COP is the engagement of big business. What, what are you doing to, to try to help with the environment, and specifically about forestation, because you work on so many agricultural products. How do you use your leverage as a huge company to help clean up the supply chain? It's a great question. So, you know, we've been working on, on this for over a, a decade, and we've already cut our greenhouse gas emissions um, in total by 7.3%, even though we're still growing, and we want to you know, get that to 27% by 2025. So we've just made uh, a big net zero commitment, and that's scope one, two, three. So that's everything from, we're basically an agricultural company, if you like, 80% of our emissions come from agriculture, all the way through to consumer. So we've made that commitment across all of our product line and all of our businesses. Um, to do that, you really have to transform your supply chain and transform your business. Um, you know, so from the ground up, we've got uh, palm oil would be, a, would be a good example of, of, of how we've uh, revolutionized our supply chain. We had 1,500 uh, suppliers in our palm oil supply chain. We've cut that down to 90 because we wanted to be able to be absolutely sure there was no deforestation in our supply chain. And so we've uh, mapped where our palm oil is coming from. We monitor that and we manage it through satellite as well as feet on the ground. So we've got to see positive action, things happening in that supply chain. Um, we've already, we have 20,000 20, suppliers around the world. We've brought in the first 200 to really work with us. So these are the top 200, which is 80% of our total commodities. And the interesting thing is when we did the analysis with them, only 10, these are the top suppliers, only 10% were using science-based targets. So there's a huge task to be done in education, collaboration, and working through that whole supply chain. But uh, that's, that's the task that needs to be done. Now, there are a few things that come to mind that I want to ask you. Um, was there a great resistance among your suppliers? Did they roll their eyes and be like, oh, I guess we have to do this because Mars is pushing us? Or did they seem to see the value in it? Yeah, it varies, to be quite frank. And that's why you know, we've, we've said we're, we're going to work with a, a coalition of the willing. And uh, we don't mind rolling of the eyes as long as you turn it into action. Um, if you roll your eyes and do nothing, that, that, that's not going to get the job done. So we've tried to support them. We've tried to work with them. We've primed the pump in many places to, to help them. And uh, you know, it's a, it really has to be a collaboration because I think when they see the benefit, they see that they can premiumize their supply chain and they can stop deforestation, that's pretty inspiring. But it does take time. Do you need to use palm oil or could you come up with an alternative? We think we do, but you know, if it's sustainable, then I'm comfortable using that, and we, we're now 100% confident that it is sustainable. Okay, let's, let's hear from you guys. What do you think about some of the things he said? Well, I'd like to ask a question. So there's been a lot of uh, movement on palm oil, and that's been a very successful area. Why is it so, so slow on the soy issue? The soy is deforesting so much of the Amazon and it seems that a coalition of businesses like yourselves could push that a bit harder, a bit faster. But before you answer that, will you just tell the audience a little bit about like, what soy is used for and where it's grown? So soy is used in a number of food products, but it's also feed for cattle. So if you grow soy and feed cattle, you're using twice as much land to get the protein to, uh, to the population. But soy is also used in a number of food products, and it's also used for other types of feed, chicken feed and that sort of thing. So growing soy in the Amazon has created a huge amount of deforestation. OK, I bought you some time. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Do you want me to answer the question? Well, yeah, yeah. I'm happy I, think to. I think it's, I'm yeah, happy. let's do that. Thank you for the time. <laughs> um, so you know, I think it was Frederick the Great said, first win somewhere, mm -hmm. then win everywhere. 
So we have a, I am fortunate enough to lead the Consumer Goods Forum uh, Coalition on Forest Positive. We have, uh, in conjunction with Carrefour, we have 20 top retailers as well as consumer goods companies, and we're going after really turning all of our land base back to forest positive. Um, we started in Palm for Mars, but we've got soya, beef, pulp are all on the list, and cocoa for us as well. So we, it's absolutely on our agenda. We're making progress. But I would say, Elizabeth, we were right to say, make faster progress, and that's the intention. OK. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about trees, um, since we're here, and that's the topic. <laughs> Um, but these are really interesting and difficult issues, so I appreciate your being open about them. Um, you've worked a lot on the ground in trying to do reforestation. Tell us, you know, some of the success stories and some of the challenges you've had in Kenya, which is one of the most beautiful countries in the world, and I can, you know, see why it's a, it's, there's so much passion there because you have a beautiful environment. It's not, uh, it's not it hasn't been spoiled. And in most places, and you, people get the value of you know. There's nothing abstract. It's it's something right in front of you all the time. Um, so yeah, share a couple stories of things that have worked and things that haven't. Let me first share that I grew up in the most forested region in Kenya, and some of my childhood memories are the trees that I could see ahead of me, the bushes beside me, so many clean streams close to my homestead listening to the bird song, seeing butterflies, things that have continued to change over time. And I think for so many parts of the world right now, the natural world that many children or many people knew back then as children have continued to change before our eyes. And one of the reasons why I'm strongly connected to the forest landscape is because I got a chance to plant my first tree when I was seven. And this was at a time when the late Professor Ngara Mathai was mobilizing women to start up tree nurseries and to grow trees in their farms because she believed in the power of those trees also increasing farm productivity because they would also help increase the soil nutrients. And having had that opportunity to also directly connect to nature, I would say that I really strongly got to love nature in the process, which is something that most of the people right now in the world do not share because we've strongly been disconnected from the natural world. And in the process, I also began to feel the pain of nature caused by environmental degradation. Seeing networks of trees being cut down made me so angry. And that anger also gave me a hunger to want to do something about challenges like deforestation and climate change. And so I began to teach children how to love nature and how to love nature through the power of trees. Because I believe in the power of trees in helping us get back to our deep sense of humanity and helping us reimagine our connection with nature. And so I started this initiative called the Green Generation Initiative to get children to love nature. And one of the key campaigns was Adopt a Tree campaign, where I'd make sure that every child in every school in my country would get a chance to plant and adopt a tree in their school compound. But then along the way, I discovered that food insecurity is one of the main impacts that has really greatly impacted the African continent and my country as well as a result of uh, the climate crisis. And so I thought to myself, how can we use the trees to also help impact on food security? So we started to establish food forests where we would pick a designated corner in the school compound and plant mixed species of fruit trees. And that would mean a nutritious source of food for the children as well. So this is a way to say that young people are not just asking for more from the leaders, but we are also on the ground trying to work on some of these solutions. But we cannot be able to do all of these on our own. We do not have all the power. We do not have all the resources that most people have. So it's just a call for people to step up and do what must be done, because we cannot stop deforestation on our own. At some point, we are growing these trees, but there are companies, organizations that are fueling deforestation, which as well continues to kind of uh, not add up to what we are trying to push at the end of the day. So it has to be collective action. It has to be 
people have to understand what their role is and what their place is and how they will help support all these initiatives that are happening. But there are so many people in the grassroots that are doing so much work, more than what is being promised and at the COP. They're doing it out there. So I think it's just about <coughs> us getting out of that inner shell and doing what must be done now. No, that's really, that's really well, well expressed. Um, you need the school's permission to plant a bunch of fruit trees in, on school property. You need the government to you know, give you the green light. Yeah. How did you secure that? Was, that? was that difficult? And yeah, tell us a little bit about that. I have had a very easy time working with schools in Kenya. And in fact, most of the times when I walk into the school, they ask, where have you been all this time? <laughs> they want they want change in their school compounds, they want the children to understand about the environment. And I have never seen so much love from nature than I have seen from the children. Every time I walk in with, school, with, with trees in the school compound and the children are so excited, they're asking when are we planting more trees again in the school compound. And it has been a process of growing trees because I know a lot of people around the world are planting the trees, but I think the big question is how many of the millions of trees that the world is planting actually get to grow up to maturity? Because a tree is just like we human beings. It needs so much. It needs to be nurtured for it to be able to survive. And that is why we use the campaign of adopt a tree. So the child is able to take good care of the tree until they are done with their school and they can pass the tree on to another child who comes into the school compound. So it's been very easy working with them. And that's what keeps me going every day because they are so passionate about the environment. They want to change the world. They want to green their schools. And even after we're done with the exercise, they go and teach their parents how to do it. This is how you protect nature. So it's just a new generation that is ready to protect the planet. Nairobi, where, where a lot of this work in and around Nairobi, is one of the greenest capital cities in the world. And uh, there's a huge forest, Karoo Forest. I used to live right near there, that's, you can just get lost in this gi gigantic forest in the middle of the city. And even besides that forest, there's just so much you know, greenery everywhere. So I mean, it's, it's wonderful to be in that environment and, and spreading these messages. Um, Sandy, d give us like a sense of how much trees need. You know, we talked before and you were explaining that there's, they're more like animals than, than we often think about. Well, we, we often think of plants as being background. So, so we often think of, you know, that we've got a background here of trees, and this is a background of trees. But each of these trees is a living organism, and each of them has relationship to the other organisms with which they live, and they have relationships to the soil, microorganisms, and the insects that feed on them. So a forest is much more than trees. A forest is a forest is a is an ecosystem. It's a it's something that that hasn't has a has a sort of um, has a life of its own. And, I, and, and so, so when you think about reforestation and, well, deforestation, I mean, what we need to do first is protect the forests that we still have. Because one third of the world's forests have been lost since the last night ice age. We've cut down huge amounts of the world's forests already. So protecting what we have left is super important. It has to be at the top. But then if we reforest, so thinking about reforestation, there's sort of some, some colleagues at the at Botanic Gardens Conservation International wrote a wonderful paper where they had 10 golden rules for reforestation. And the first one was protect natural forests. The second one was work with communities. The third one was, you know, use lots of species, you know, and, and, and sort of, you know, these are 10 golden rules and you don't have to do them all. But thinking about reforesting is about thinking about a forest as opposed to something that's all the same. And there was something called the Bond Challenge, which was about, and again, thinking about commitments people make and whether they actually kind of come through with those. The Bond Challenge was a few years ago, and countries pledged to reforest certain percentages of their land area. And something that I find worrying is that most of those pledges are to put plantation forests in as reforestation. And for me, that's not reforestation. That's big plantation forests which get cut down, so the trees probably don't even make it to maturity. So thinking about those reforestation, and I think the work that Elizabeth does in Kenya is so wonderful because you know, each of these trees is nurtured 
and it has a multiple purpose. So a tree is, 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 a, is a living thing. Well, I wanted, I wanted to ask you two specifically, like how much work does it take after you plant the tree to make sure that it survives? I would say it's more lifetime because you can imagine the power that you feel years after you grew a tree and you're able to go back there and see this is what I did. And the reason I said that is because I went back to my former high school and there's this huge tree that I planted when I got into the school. And every time I look up to that tree, I feel so happy. I feel, I just, I just feel like so much love for the environment and so much love for nature. So what happens is that when you plant the tree, there's so much period of time that you need to take good care of that tree and especially if it's a fruit tree because the fruit trees are really uh, delicate, I would say. And what we do is that we have to do a follow-up for about six to seven months before we can say that the tree is actually going to survive on its own. Because at some point we plant really tiny seedlings. And when the seedling is really tiny, it needs to also get so much water. And sometimes the rains are, are failing. And like I mentioned in my country right now, it's become so unpredictable to to know when the rains are going to come or when it's going to get dry. So you might find that we've planted the trees in the schools, hoping that there's going to be rains and then the rains fail. And that means that the children have to water the trees almost every day or at least uh, twice every week or sometimes thrice every week. So there's so much work that goes into just making sure that that tree grows, which is why sometimes uh, there are people that do like large scale tree planting that is not really impactful. Because for me, impact is not writing up in a big newspaper saying that we grew two million trees. The impact is I want to know how many of those two million trees got to grow to maturity after one year or after two years, which is one thing that I think people do not understand. It's about making sure that there's so much work that goes into making sure the tree grows. It's not just planting. I think it's, uh, and that's one thing that Wangari Mathai always said that until you dig a hole, plant a tree, water it, nurture it, and make sure that it grows to maturity, you're not doing a thing, you're just talking. So I think it's important that we move to make sure that we're actually doing the actual work on the ground and it's a whole process. There's a lot that goes into making sure that. I, I think that's quite important because I think that the thing about, um, growing trees is once you've, you, once you've built a new forest or you've built a new set of trees, the really important thing is to protect it. Yeah. Because you could grow a new forest and cut it down yeah. and then you've reforested, but, but you haven't actually. Yeah. You've a just you've subtracted it. So it is, it is a lifetime and, and trees have very long lifetimes. I mean, trees have, are, live for hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, they live much longer than human beings do. So a tree that you planted in your school, your grandchildren will probably see it, which is a wonderful thing. The, the woman she's, uh, Elizabeth has mentioned, Wangari Mathai, won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize for her activism in, in, in Kenya. And this forest that I used to live near, she, I think, had chained herself. I mean, they were gonna, there was a moment uh, during the, the government of Daniel Arab Moy, which was very corrupt, where he had taken this beautiful forest, which is like the, the lungs of Nairobi, and he had parceled it out to his friends to develop. And she was very brave and stood up to the most powerful forces in her country and saved this, this forest among, I mean, that's just what I know, but I'm sure there's many other stories like that. So it takes, it takes, it takes, you know, it takes guts. Um, what have you guys seen or felt over the years in the change of the interest in, in deforestation? You've been working around this space for a while. Can I, can I just offer that I just really relate to Elizabeth because I grew up as a child spending summers in a wilderness area. And this year, it burnt to the ground in the fires in Northern California. And those fires are purely coming from the climate change that's happening. And so forests are vastly important, but if we don't get the climate change under control, we're going to lose more and more and more, and we can continue replanting, but it's, 
becoming dire in terms of the need to not just see replanting forests as changing climate change, but doing everything that we have to do. There are no one silver bullet that will actually change the problem. And again, if you plant the trees, but it's too dry to maintain them over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it, it, it doesn't refurbish and, and regrow and become the new normal that we all want it to be. So we really need to get our climate under control, get our energy systems transitioned. But trees are an important part of that. Trees are a very important part of getting our climate under control. So you can't have one without the other. No, agreed. So they, they go hand in hand. Agreed. But, but your point is that the trees are delicate and that they will be the victims of this overall climate change. Um, no, I think it's a really interesting point. What have you seen over the years of companies' interests, suppliers, and how much they care about deforestation? Um, maybe just give you a personal context first, which is uh, I just got back from Kenya two weeks ago, and I think I walked the forest that you're, you're talking about, and I saw some of the drought conditions that you had there, so I, I really empathize with you know, the passion that you have. I came from a very different background. I grew up uh, about 30 miles from here with Long Island Power Station here, Kincardine Power Station here, and the biggest chemical works uh, in Europe at Grangemouth. Um, so I didn't have your early passion uh, for nature. So for me, it's been an awakening and, and seen the importance of that. And particularly when you see there's the land mass <coughs> One and a half times the land mass of Scotland has been lost every year. And so we've got to reverse that trend, to your point around greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I've seen a lot more. Uh, there's always been commitments. But I think the time for commitments is behind us. As I said earlier, it's necessary, but now we need the action. And I, I'm seeing my peer groups, my customers, my suppliers, um, putting in the necessary, one, metrics, and two, the transparency. So if you go on the uh, Consumer Goods Forum website on Forest Positive, you'll see each of the 20 companies is now transparent around how it's doing against key metrics. And we need, that's 20 companies that are doing that, but a lot more committed. But we need not 20, we need not 200, not 2,000, we need 2 million. But I think once you get the momentum rolling and consumers recognize that, I think you're going to see it really accelerating. Do you have any labels on your products that, that, that advertise like what you're doing? That's a great question. So the consumer, I think, is really confused right now on what is uh, greenhouse gas emissions, what's scope one, two, three, what's reforestation, what's forest positive. So we've really got a, a, a challenge to educate the consumer. But I think it starts with your own, what we call associates. We have 135,000 employees. They're really driven by our purpose, which is the world we want tomorrow it starts with how we do business today. And we've tried to enable them to, to move forward as well. So we, what we've just launched, actually, just I think we just announced a couple of days ago, that the uh, Mars bar, which those of you in the UK will know is the iconic. Should have uh, brought a bunch for all of us. I was hoping you would. I mean, I should really be the one that brought them. But um, So the Mars bar, which is the iconic confectionery brand in the UK, is uh, just committed to be carbon neutral by uh, January 1st, 2023, which for me is 2022. Uh, and uh, I think that will be a really great consumer test to find out, is that engaging? Do they understand it? How can we educate it more? But there's lots of companies, retailers are signage in stores. Uh, you've seen uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles come out with his terracotta symbol to put on packages. So there's consumer momentum. I would say it's a growing awareness, but nothing I would say that, you know, a consumer walks in and pulls a differentiated product off the shelf, but that will happen. Right, no, I'm sure so, it will. Yeah, so, so I think that's, I went to, I went to a, a, a panel the other day where they talked about this, about eco-labeling, and talking about that there's sort of three, there's three kind of things that you really want to know in eco-labeling. There's, there's carbon, there's water, and there's biodiversity. And so you could almost have something which was red, yellow, green on those three sorts of things. And at the Natural History Museum, some of my colleagues are looking at biodiversity intactness in a way such that you could actually look at whether, whether you could develop a metric for biodiversity. 
that, that, a, that a particular product had, had things. So, so it seems like, you know, for those of us in countries where we have the luxuries to buy goods that are, that are labeled, that's really important. But so many people are on the front line of deforestation and the front line of climate change, and they don't have the, the luxury of being able to sort of choose because it's a, it's a, it's a matter of day-to-day -day survival. So, so I think, I think we, as, as respond, we as consumers in this part of the world really need to think responsibly about what we consume. Now, speaking of biodiversity, how difficult is it to replant a biodiverse rainforest? It's, it's impossible to plant it from the get-go, but what the most important thing is to let nature take its course and to let natural regeneration create that forest. Because every, you know, you could, this is a forest, right? But this is a forest, this is, this is beautiful. But none of these plants would grow together normally. I mean, none of these plants would grow together. But it's, it, but it's gorgeous. But natural regeneration is always the best. How long does it take? So if there's been clear cutting in the Amazon and you wanted to, you left it alone and you wanted to regrow to what Leaving it, it alone is like the really most important thing of all is just to leave it alone. So I lived in Panama. I lived in Panama when I was in the 1980s when I was at university. And, um, and, and I read the, the chronicles of the, of the Spanish who went to Panama and discovered, they didn't really discover it, it was there all along, the Pacific Ocean. And they wrote about riding through savanna, riding through grass. And when I went to those same places, they were huge trees. So it's, it's 100 years, 200 years. I mean, it depends on the forest. It really, really depends on the forest. And it's very context specific. So to grow a forest in near Nairobi might take a shorter time than to grow a forest in the Amazon. But to grow a truly mature forest takes a very long time. And it requires more than just the trees. There's all the understory and the lianas that the, that the orangutans, for example, depend on, which are gone in palm oil plantations, for example. So it's, so it's all that kind of interconnect, interconnectedness of things, which nature does it much better than we could do by designing it. Oh, that makes sense. Um, OK, we have less than 10 minutes left. I would love to hear from you guys. Uh, some thoughts, some questions for our panelists. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for your time to the entire panel. Uh, incredibly proud that uh, Mr. Reid, a Scotsman, has reached the heady, influential heights of big commerce. My question is, how can Mars make profit by fighting global warming. At the end of the day, you gotta look after your shareholders, and that's the reality. How, what are your plans to make profit out of the fight? Yeah, first, first I'd say you know, thank you for the, the compliment. Um, the, the, the second thing I'd say is, uh, I, I, I think the two can live side by side. They have to live side by side. You know, we, we, we're a family-based company, and I'm fortunate that I work for real people who really care about these things. And that's not new. The, there's a letter which is in our museum in McLean, Virginia, where I am, from 1947, before this was fashionable, from one of our owners, saying the role of a company is the mutuality of benefits for its stakeholders, its customers, its competitors, and the world. Um, so it's a, it's a long-held belief, and we've demonstrated with something we call the economics of mutuality, that you can do good for the environment and your stakeholders, and do well. And you know we're pr we've spent a billion dollars priming that pump for sustainability in a generation. But I am absolutely convinced that if you use the right suppliers, growing crops in the right way, using regenerative agricultural techniques, which improves the soil, improves the yield, and sequesters carbon, consumers will pay for that and will have a successful business. Uh, I really believe that with my fiber. Robin, what's, what's your reaction to that? 
I think it's possible to be profitable and be green. And I think it just takes the commitment and the willingness to put the time and effort into it. It's just a longer term return, isn't it? Yeah. Great. Another question, please. Hi. I have a bit of a big question. Uh, we talk about wanting to stop deforestation, but in a lot of the countries that have these old growth forests, they're still developing and they're going through industrialization. And it's sometimes difficult to use, you know, price signaling or getting consumers to be kind of on the side of protecting these rainforests because that's not where these products are being sold. So how do we go about, you know, how do we go about protecting these forests when the governments aren't interested in doing so, basically? Uh, Elizabeth, I mean, you're, you're, you're in Kenya. Like what, the public awareness about protecting the forest, the government's position about protecting the forest, what have you observed? I think people do want to protect the forests and a lot of people agree with the fact that we have to let the trees live, we have to let the forest live right now, and it's not about giving ourselves a grace period, because as we give ourselves those grace periods that we are saying that we want to start acting in 2030 or 2050, people are still suffering from the climate crisis. Right now, as we speak here, there are people that don't know where the next meal is going to come from because of the droughts. And I think what's really important is that the people who now understand what's happening, who feel strongly that they need to see change happen are the people that are going to make change happen. And it's, it's about putting pressure because at the end of the day, most of the people are doing what's supposed to be done. But on the other side, big corporations and governments are still continuing on with business as usual and they're still continuing on to fuel uh, deforestation. So from what I have seen, I also lead a campaign that is focused on protecting trees in the cities. And it's actually a whole coalition that's called Daima where civic actors have come together to advocate for the protection of urban green spaces. And we started in Nairobi. And one of the very um, most memorable thing that we ever did was protecting a 100 year old iconic fig tree that was on the way of, uh, the construction of a road and we had so many people that came to really say that we need this tree protected and that people power is what will continue to put pressure and then make governments change because at the end of the day we cannot sit back and watch them turn our planet to become uninhabitable everyone has got the kind of a vision of the world that they want to live in. I have a vision of the world that I want to live in. And as a young person, I believe that every other young person has a right to live their hopes and dreams without fear of the future or without fear of how the planet is going to be. And this is only going to be made possible if those people that understand that there's a problem continue to not remain silent. Because if all of us remain silent, then things are going to be, to be terrible. So those of us who are strongly disturbed and feel that there's a problem, it's that people power that is going to make change happen. Now, Elizabeth, let me just follow up. He, he, he's explained like what his big company is doing to kind of keep these issues front and center. In Kenya, you have big dairy companies, big food production companies. Are they at all uh, you know, involved, engaged with these issues? And have you tried to reach them on the business side? So I haven't really engaged with any of them, but I would say most of the work that I can see being done in terms of reforestation and in terms of trying to halt deforestation is being done by the grassroots communities. Okay, I mean, I think like, if you could get big business in, in East Africa to care about these issues and make some of the commitments that would probably you know, go a long way because they are part of the agricultural supply chain and, um, you know, like what, what these other companies are doing, I could see that spreading. Um, we have time maybe for one more question. Could I just, I would just like to respond to that a little bit because the, um, the biggest driver of deforestation is agriculture. That's the biggest threat to trees is agriculture. But actually we have enough agricultural land and, and there's, there's been some really interesting work done by a group called World in Data, where they look at how you could actually um, change that. How you could, uh, we, we have enough agricultural land. So what you can do is we can change dietary habits. We can increase crop yields. 
We can look at trade in, in a way such that you minimize biodiversity loss. And then a couple of other things. But one, each one of those things on its own won't make a difference. And each one of those things is actually not the governments of the countries that are deforesting. It's us. Is our changing our dietary habits, our doing something, actually is we are helping to drive deforestation as well. So it's, it's actually grassroots actions everywhere by every person that really make a difference. But you mean consumers, like that's... Consumers, like, right, yeah, so right. it's, no, consumers. No, no, it's, it's consumers and people planting trees as well. I mean, planting trees is really fun. You know, it's, it gives you, a, as Elizabeth says, it gives you this massive sense of satisfaction that if you have something that grows and is alive. But actually, the choices that we make as consumers and, you know, the choices that companies make, you know, we can choose with our feet companies that, that actually are green or not green. We can, we here can, but not necessarily, you know, the people on the front line can't necessarily make that choice. Yeah, I would also like to add that I think the system is a bit more on making sure it's two-way, that it's about individual responsibility, but on the other hand, it's also about systems change, and we can never separate the two of them. Mm -hmm. If we do not want consumers to be on that line, then also it's about the big companies as well. Like everybody needs to completely change their ways. It's not about uh, getting to a point where we are uh, we are saying that you know because people are consuming, then we'll continue with business as usual. I think it's also about making sure that everybody does what's supposed to be done, and also like when it comes to nature-based solutions, we've seen. Uh, big companies and corporations that are using that as an excuse to get away from the real problem. You know, they're using that as an excuse to not cut emissions because we are planting trees here, then we will continue with business as usual, which I think is a terrible mistake that will not help us tackle the climate crisis. So it has to be individual responsibility and system change at the same time. I was going to say one last question, but we're out of time, and that's a great note to end on. Perfect. So thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, I thought it was a great discussion. And thank you guys for, for being up here with us. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.